as you know from this morning, I'm very enthusiastic. And um, I had the opportunity to speak to Vanessa for the first time, well, about a week ago, actually, didn't I? And we were talking about what, what would this session look like, pulling it all together. And actually, we, had, we have a lot of commonality, even though we look at it from different perspectives. And I hope you'll see that. We've been clearly doing some work um, in different places, but really all pulled together about trying to reduce catheter-associated infections across the organisation. So we're a double act today. What we're going to do, just to set up the session, is we've both got 20-minute presentations just to share our experiences with you, and then we're going to open up the floor um, to, to hear your views, your ideas, your thoughts, any questions. Okay, so I'm going to hand over ably to Vinas. Uh, thank you, Julia. Um, our journey starts in the acute hospital and ends up in the community. Um, and then I think Julia's going to bring it all back to the uh, acute setting um, again. So hopefully we'll complement each other. Um, I'm a head of nursing corporate support services. It sounds a bit vague, but I've got various specialist nursing teams that I look after, which includes infection prevention and the continence team, amongst others. Um, so... Um, it was great to bring all those teams together and um, to see how they complement each other and, and this was one of the areas they most certainly did. So I come from Wolverhampton, um, it's not the most glamorous city, um, but we've done a lot of work to reduce some healthcare associated infection and we've been at this for uh, a long time and got a bit of a reputation for that part of, um, of the work. Um, there's about 250,000 population in Wolverhampton, and it's really diverse and ethnic uh, in its ethnicity um, uh, and its population. Um, social deprivation is a major problem. I think the last count we were the fifth most deprived city uh, in Wolverhampton, which does have an impact on obesity and diabetes and lots of other um, I I issues. Alcoholism is um, a, a, a real problem, and all of that impacts on reduced um, life expectancy. So the services are all under a huge amount of pressure, as they are anywhere, every everywhere, but um, that, that all helps, um, that all does impact. Um, the other thing for telling you a bit of the geography is that you might have an area that's, that, you know, 250,000 population or a similar uh, background, so um, talking to people today, I would say, um, if you think this works useful, you probably don't need to repeat it. You could, it's not a, a research study in any way, but you could probably say, well, actually, I'm going on Wolverhampton's findings. Um, I think we're in a similar position because um, it's a lot of work to actually um, um, start off. So we had a, a project um, reduced at long term, reducing long-term urinary catheterisation. Um, this started um, quite a few years ago now when we did a point prevalence of catheters. And we were really, really shocked to find that we had about 250 catheterised patients in Wolverhampton. Now, that was about five years ago. And at the moment, the total 600 urinary catheters, uh, catheterised patients in Wolverhampton. So it's gone up and up <laughs> over, over the years, um, which was a real concern when we revisited this. Um, we want to, um, to, to identify some of the practicalities of addressing long-term catheters, and I hope that comes across during the session. Um, but also we want to stimulate this discussion about um, targeting catheters, not only as a way of reducing um, E. coli bacteremia, but actually of reducing harm uh, in general. So the background is that we started from an acute perspective looking at um, device-related bacteremia. So this was, uh, we got on top of MRSA bacteremia back in the day, and about 10 years ago, we thought, well, what next? So we started to look at all bloodstream infections that were linked to a device. Didn't matter what that device was, if it was a medical device, um, we counted it. And you can see there, when the first year, we had 140 cases. And this was done through a microbiologist um, and an infection prevention nurse um, looking at each um, case, so we have electronic surveillance, so um, our system ICNET would flag up um, positive bacteremia cases, positive bloodstream infections, um, and then we, the infection prevention team would go and ask the question about was there a device involved. Um, over the years, we've implemented lots of different things. Um, we've really um, worked on catheter care in the acute trust, um, but also and we've introduced an IV team. So um, patients get their IV um, lines much quicker and um, 
and they're put in in a much more controllable environment. So that's had a huge impact, and, uh, and uh, that's another one of the groups that I look after. So um, the cases of what we call DRHABs, device related to hospital acquired bacteremias, came down to 51 last year, which was great. And this year we're on target for about 42. So we're reducing and reducing in the acute. And when we looked at the uh, composition of those, um, the um, central lines were a huge problem. Uh, following the introduction of the IV team, less of a problem, but urinary catheters as a proportion really came to the fore. You could see that the top there, the numbers have, have dropped in that quarter. So, um, so urinary catheters started to come onto our concern list in a bigger way. Um, and then we started looking at, well, some of these, um, we are seeing patients coming into ED with bacteremia as well, and looking at um, the, applying the same principles as the acute bacteremia acquisitions to, to the community ones. So this is data from our community uh, patients that come in straight to ED, and we have a look at what their bacteremia um, originated from. And where there's a device, we count them uh, in the numbers. And you can see there... Um, the type of organisms. And if you read uh, E. coli for catheters, um, it pretty much always is from the community. Um, that is a big um, proportion of um, the community bacteremias. And again, you can see there um, that this shows um, the number, the blue is the number of community acquired bacteremias, and there's a proportion, um, the, the uh, so the, the full line is community bacteremias, but the um, red is the, uh, sorry, the blue is those that are linked to urinary catheters. The red, sorry, is um, a hospital. So a really big proportion. Um, so Project Catheter Safety came into, um, into being. Um, we wanted to reduce the unplanned community catheterizations in particular. District nurses were telling us all the time that... Um, we had, um, there was going to far too many urgent call-outs about urinary catheters. In fact, you couldn't at one stage talk to a district nurse for more than about 20 minutes without their phone going and uh, an urgent um, uh, uh, request being made to go and visit a patient because a catheter had blocked or expelled um, or was causing them uh, some other prod uh, um, problems. Um, so within the, the project, we look to standardise um, equipment um, for long-term uh, urinary catheterisation, uh, which we did. We uh, um, developed a preferred list, uh, standardising the catheters, because we had all sorts of catheters being used in the community. It was really a, just a pick and mix of, um, of catheters, silicon, latex, PTFE-coated um, catheters. Um, so we standardised on a sil all silicon catheter. Um, we also standardised the um, leg bags and the other products that went with the catheter because that's where we saved the money to pay for the, the silicon catheter, so that was completely cost neutral. Um, we also wanted to review the patients um, with long-term catheters in Wolverhampton, and that's where this presentation really um, focuses um, from here on in, really. We wanted to know why these patients had a catheter and why, um, it, why it hadn't come out um, earlier, why they still had it some years and years later. Um, we wanted to look at, were they on the prescri prescription? Were they actually using their preferred list? Had they switched um, or been switched um, where it was appropriate? And also what was happening about their, um, what was impacting, what needed to be changed in the care plan to make the catheter less troublesome? Some of these patients we found um, over the course of the project were having up to four catheters a week and some ten in a you know, two-month period. And you think the amount of uh, trauma that that causes to the urinary tract to keep on recatheterizing and the risk there to patients. Um, we were really, really concerned. So... Um, we classed a high-risk bacteremia as two or more catheter changes in three months or an admission to ED. So we developed a project plan, which uh, I appreciate you can't see the detail of, um, but just to show how we structured um, with a, a, a main aim of the project. And this is something that's been really perpetuated by NHS England and the co uh, collaboratives that many of you might have been involved in um, over the last couple of years. Um, we then standardised our objectives and, and our measures to try and make sure that we could track any um, improvement. And pre-project, we looked at um, what, um, what data was available to us. Um, 
We, um, we looked at the average number of catheterised patients that have been discharged from the acute hospital. We have been tracking this for a while. Um, so we took a three-month average, and that was 63 catheterised patients a month being discharged. Um, and that's something that's quite useful, actually, to monitor in the future to see if we can make a, a reduction there and really bats it back to the acute side. When we look at those cases um, in um, more detail, we tend to find that it's about a third split, so a third of patients that have come in with a long-term urinary catheter and been dis discharged again with it, but we're missing an opportunity there to review. Um, a third are patients that are under urology that are probably going to be sorted. You know, if they're under urology, they're being followed up, if urology's got an outreach team, that's kind of okay. But worryingly, about a third of patients were um, not followed up. Uh, they were just discharged to community nurses, and nobody really knew what was going to happen um, after that. Although a lot of assumptions were made in the acute trust that community nurses would deal with it um, and potentially do a trial without catheter, which our district nurses don't routinely do. Um, we, uh, so we can see here the uh, table in the middle shows the number of urinary catheters. So we had been working at this for a while. So we had some district nurses we had got, got to and, you know, um, started to look at, and they were starting to get less tolerance of catheters and qu really questioning why they were in. So um, there has been a little reduction. But what we really wanted to do was to understand them all. Um, our average a &E attendances are and still are 14 um, patients um, a month on average that attend a &E because of a catheter-related problem. And it was perceived in a &E that this has been an increase um, recently. Um, and uh, I've, I've mentioned the GP preferred list of products, which has actually just been reviewed again. So during the project, we looked at 716 patients with a urinary catheter. So although that sounds more than we have in the trust at any one time, obviously this is a constantly moving feast and the project went over five months. So um, the continent service assessed all patients with urinary catheter that had a catheter from the moment, um, uh, from September until, um, until um, just recently, the end of January. So that was um, a continuous uh, process. Um, and you can see there um, the catheter changes. Um, oh, I don't know, I've got 63%. Yeah, so 191 catheters removed. Um, and when we first started out, we thought well, we're bound to find loads of urinary catheters in nursing homes and, and residential homes, but actually we found that wasn't the case. And if anything, our nursing homes were quite intolerant of catheters. Um, and the vast majority, 88% of urinary catheters, were in patients' own homes, um, quite hidden, really. Um, we looked at indication for urinary catheter, and probably, unsurprisingly, retention or urinary obstruction came in um, as the highest um, uh, uh, proportion. However, um, there was some doubt about whether that really was um, retention and w why that patient had a catheter, why they hadn't been changed to intermittent self-catheterisation or um, suprapubic catheter. Um, we've, we tried to, and uh, we, um, we still are working through um, a lot of those, um, lot of those patients. But um, not all of those patients were uh, male by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and we did feel that um, because it's a mandatory field on discharge to, to make the referral to district nurses to say why the catheter's in, that a lot of people had just said retention, 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 because they knew the catheter would be accepted by the district nurses. Um, the um, areas on the side are in line with an um, acronym that we use called Houdini to look at how, why the catheter's in. Um, I think lots of you nodding, you'd be familiar with that. Um, so you can see how low some of the, the categories are. Um, we have got quite a proactive tissue viability service, so they don't really stick um, catheters being in for um, the use of, of pressure ulcer management um, unless it's for, for extremely rare and uh, exceptional circumstances. So they're really involved with there. So I can understand why that would be so low. Um, but we did have this other category. And... Um, one of the things that um, I think probably needs to be a bit of a change to Houdini is this neurogenic uh, bladder 
issue and it'd be interesting to know your thoughts on that because um, those patients we know have got a catheter in for an absolute bona fide reason and the continent service actually sits as part of the MDT locally for, um, for um, neuro services. So um, all of those 55 were known to the continent service and they come to the end of the road with continent's products. So um, I think that may be something that Houdini maybe needs to cover a little bit more. But there was also 60 patients, which honestly were completely not known. And some of these patients had catheters up to 20 years. But when the patients were approached, they were straight away, you're not taking my catheter out, are you? So definitely some um, work to do there. Um, looking at the background data over the period that we looked at, and you can see from the chart here how stable, really, and uh, the um, ANT, the bottom line is the number of ED admissions, but, the, um, but also um, the number of ED admissions with um, attendances with sepsis. So you can just see that all of those were admitted, and that those were the patients that were admitted. So the patients coming into ED aren't necessarily being admitted un, um, you know, without good reason, um, but they are taking up time in ED, these patients. Um, <coughs> And the, num the line is gradually um, increasing. And we think some of that's down to nursing homes that haven't got staff that are skilled in, in recatheterisation, um, referring in, or bouncing patients in. Um, and the number of patients um, discharged monthly is just climbing. Um, you and Retractor... Um, um, sorry, long-term urine catheters are reported by district nurses have declined slightly, but have plateaued again now. So we now have a, a job to do with district nurses, and we've just engaged our first district nursing ward in a, um, in a PDSA cycle, so looking at Plan Do Study Act, cycles of improvement, and um, to see what does it take to change district nurses' hearts and minds. Um, so there's some, some more work to do there. So looking more at the outcomes then from the uh, project, um, the, the preferred list was launched. Um, we had quite a, a, well, quite a discussion with urology and continence um, and uh, elderly medicine really about what should be on this. Um, and then we had to get it past the GPs, the area prescribing group. Um, and sometimes there was a bit of a, 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 to begin with, a bit of um, a concern about why are we looking at this, why is this important. But I think we've heard from some of the other sessions here about the, just the pure numbers of patients that are on these products. And it, it's really hard to know whether the, it's a catheter that um, is likely to be tolerated better um, long term, as all silicon would be, rather than patients who are just on latex catheters out there. So at least we know we're at a common starting point block. What we did find was we went to an silicon catheter and the urology consultant hadn't been involved in the initial work and when he looked at it later he felt it was too flexible um, for long term use so we've just switched to another one so we'll see um, what happens there but that's all in the learning. Um, uh, we've assessed all the patients now, as I've just um, uh, fed back to you. Um, we've, um, mo we've moved all patients over. That was a tricky, trying to move 600 patients over onto a product um, via lots of different GP surgeries um, was really challenging. We do use a, a distribution company, um, so they did about 50% of them, but it was, it was a long job trying to get that sorted. Um, we have a patient health catheter record being trialled, so you might call it a passport, in, um, in three nursing homes. Homes, um, and that's just been, we've just heard that's been accepted and that can roll out now. Um, and the district nurses are also looking at various new ways of documenting catheters. We have a clinical web portal that GPs access as well as the acute trust, so um, putting information on there. We've also um, talked to the commissioners about a business case so that patients that are discharged from the acute trust with a urinary catheter um, can go to a service, which will hopefully be run by the continence team, where their catheter is reviewed or they're reviewed in light and their, the reason for their catheter. So the continence team, who ably and every week teach intermittent self catheterisation, um, potentially will be um, looking at whether these patients need a catheter or not. Obviously, if they're under urology, then they'll be liaising with the urology service to make sure that their objectives are met. But if they're not, then, um, you know, why, what's, 
what's the, um, the issue would be to try and convince patients that actually it's catheter short term, there's other things we can do, and that really um, the only time you'll need a long term if we've tried everything else try and get rid of some of the, the problems um, and I've said improved engagement with district nurses which is really just starting um, to take off. Um, we had quite a few challenges in uh, delivering this project and the project really was a fact-finding project. Um, it's step two now of it that we're just going into where we're going to really see, we hope, big reductions in the number of urinary catheterised patients in Wolverhampton. Um, the coding of district nurses' activity was really inconsistent and really, really hard. And actually, we haven't one of the outcome measures that we haven't got yet, in, in fact, I just got another spreadsheet sent to me this morning, was... Um, was district nurses' activity during the, the, the five months. So what we're looking to see is that district nurse activity for unplanned catheter changes is decreasing. Um, but I think with this next step um, of the project, um, it certainly will. Um, we uh, identified the reason for the catheter, as I've previously said. When the continence nurses did the work, they looked at a number of electronic platforms to try and get the information. So they were looking at the care home records, the GP records, the electronic patient record, the, the, they were asking the patient, they were asking the next of kin, um, because in some of them, it took every single one of those lines until the last one said, and this is why the patient's got a catheter or had it five years ago. So it's really hard sometimes to find this out. Um, the constant flow of discharged patients was a bit of a nightmare as well, trying to make sure that you captured them all, all the time. Um, and um, the poor documentation in care homes. So in some care homes, I'm afraid to say, they haven't got the spelling of the patient's name right, let alone their NHS number. So that could be, um, that could be tricky. And when you're trying to follow on what's happening with patients through all of these electronic systems relying on that detail, <laughs> patient identifiable detail, it was, it was problematic. Um, so the next steps, um, as I said, the commissioning conversations are going on. Uh, with Trial Without Catheter Clinics as well, we're um, investigating, although I'm, there's a lot of experience out there now with a clinic-based uh, Trial Without Catheter. Um, the number of unplanned catheter changes, as I've said, and um, acute areas really need to start reducing the number of catheters. Um, and we've got a uh, consultant neurologist presenting in April to kick off that um, work stream. So I think that's it. Um, we've, it's 246 patients that are now need action plans um, uh, to look at. That was how many patients had uh, two or more catheter changes. So, um, so lots of work to do, um, and it's ongoing once you start. But as I said earlier, I think if you have an uncoordinated catheter discharge pathway, then you probably don't need to repeat all of this. You probably just need to get on with it and start from there. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Okay, so I, I'm going to talk a bit about our experience um, in an acute organisation. Um, just to tell you a little bit about our organisation, it's actually the, um, uh, the acute hospital and the community service are all one organisation. And it was quite new when that was happening, so it was a really good opportunity to sort of think about ourselves as a whole organisation and get everybody involved at the start. So this is just a little bit about our journey. So I want to just talk to you a little bit about the context for the project, how we got it started, what we've done, a little bit about our results, and then next steps. So why did we even think about looking at um, um, Cortes? Well, the organisation wants to be the safest organisation in the NHS, and so as part of that, they developed a quality improvement account, and, and it was part of providing safe, clean and personal care. And as you can see there, Corti was in the, the clean part of our element of projects. Now, this was our reality. So we, um, as, a, as a group, so there was a, a urologist, myself, and, um, and one of the nurses that I sort of co coerced, no, I didn't really, encouraged, <laughs> shall I say, to, to join us. And we went and we did a, a quick audit to have a look and see what was going on on our wards. 20% of the patients, these probably don't come as too surprised. So we know that from the uh, Institute of Health Improvement that one in five people will have catheters in 
And I didn't think that that was going to be the same in our organisation, but clearly it was. Quite a few people didn't have documentation, so at this time we had some paper notes and we had electronic records. We had up to 41% who had courtes, 70% of those we know are preventable, and interestingly, especially from the comment this morning, 60% of the medical staff, when asked, didn't actually know that their patients had a catheter in situ. And how many patients then do we extrapolate could die in our organisation if we worked that out? And we worked out that there was probably about 17 patients a year that would die from corti-related sepsis. So it's clearly a big issue. We did ask our patients, and really in the literature there's not a lot about us asking patients what's the impact for having catheters, although probably you, know, you and I that work with patients know that this is the case. But interestingly, 18% of patients didn't know why they were catheterised, and 70% were never given an option, and 30% actually felt that they could have managed a different way. So it was really telling from the patient's point of view. The biggest, thing that, or the biggest thing that made an impact initially when we started was to have conversations about catheters and get a feel about the culture in the organisation. You know, this was really an innocuous device, isn't it? We've, everybody has catheters, we use them very frequently. People die from it. So it really made an impact talking about it in a different way. So how did we do it? Well, we decided rather than carrying on doing what we did, and bumping our head down the, the steps a bit like Edward Bear here, that we do something differently. And we decided we use quality improvement approach. We had three phases. I'm not going to talk about all three, but just to give you a sense of what happened. Our first phase looked at achieving a 30% reduction, and we, we brought together some pilot wards and a, group, a t couple of teams from the community service. And we developed um, a quality improvement approach, we use this breakthrough series that you may be familiar with. So first of all, we had a faculty, as I said, that was myself, one of the consultant urologists, one of the urology registrars, and a quality improvement facilitator. And we looked to um, deciding to how we drive the education. And we would have three learning sessions over a year, and in between those learning sessions, when we brought all the pilot wards together, they would then go away, and in between times, after they had this education, they put some things to the test. Now, what they put to the test was up to them, although we did try and facilitate and support what were areas we thought might need um, looking at, and so that they would all choose different things, rather than them all going away and testing the same thing in, in lots of multiple areas. And why do we do that? Because people are generally better persuaded by reasons which they discover themselves. So it's not about a telling, it's about more about a coaching approach and a real quality improvement approach to making a change. This is the model for improvement. So three key things. What's your aim? So what you're trying to accomplish. What's your measurement? Really important that you decide what you're going to measure and keep consistent with that. So in our first phase, we spent a whole year trying to think about what was our definition, and actually that's not really so much what matters, but how are you going to measure it? What changes can we make? And then doing some small tests of change. And why do we do that? Because we know that you may make lots of changes, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get an improvement. So if we test it and then we can keep looking at the data, we can see which ones are going to make an improvement. And this is just an example of that. So rather than keep on painting the walls of this building to see which one's going to make an improvement, we might use little test pots. That's the principle. And of course, we shared some of these quality improvement tools and the reasons why to the, to the people who were involved in that collaborative so that they could learn those as well and then go and share it with others. Phase two, we looked at taking this out, out of the pilot wards, what we'd learned across the organisation and with an aim to try and reduce courtes by 20%. And phase three, which I'll focus a little bit more on, was to look at what inappropriate catheters, so Vanessa talked about what is an inappropriate catheter, and um, using Houdini wasn't, hadn't been really taken up by any people in the organisation, and it didn't come out in any of the quality improvements. So I'm going to share a little bit with you about uh, what they decided. 
And it was also attached to a sequin, which we talked about this morning, having sequins to motivate that. And it meant that it allowed us to open up a conversation with the CCG about what did they want to see, what did we want to see, and we would look at what sort of measures and how we would be able to demonstrate evidence around that. So why catheterize at all? Well, they didn't use Houdini. They developed the TRAP acronym, and you'll hear me talking about that. And I'll share a little video with you uh, in a little while just to express that a little bit more. But Vanessa talked about nurses sending patients out of their organizations from the acute setting by shoe, what I refer to as shoehorning the, the appropriateness into a box which says you can only say it's acute retention. And we realized that patients still had catheters in and that although they might have gone in appropriately for retention, for example, that they were still in there and they hadn't had TWOCs done on a regular basis or they hadn't been offered intermittent self-catheterization, etc. Sometimes we'd see electronic data where they put it in for retention and then, of course, they have to record the residual volume, which it was 50 mils, now clearly the patient's not in retention. So again, there's maybe an education piece. So we knew that there were variations. We suspected there was shoehorning, and we decided that we would try and use an audit tool to capture the number of inappropriate catheters uh, in the organization. So we developed this audit tool, and you won't be surprised to hear me say that it was the first draft because we were going to, what we wanted to do was to test the audit tool. And we engaged all the senior nurses who did the safety thermometer data. And we asked them, rather than doing that on the weeks that they were going out, would they please take the tool out? So what happened? Well, of course, we did a PDSA cycle. We gave them the draft tool. We thought that maybe we might have to redefine, uh, refine it. We gave them a five minute briefing they went out and they captured the data. And when we had a look at it, we actually saw that there was some lack of agreement, although there was some area where we couldn't identify if the senior nurses actually thought if that was appropriate. So we changed the draft tool and we tried it again. So we redefined the tool, we sent out, we gave a briefing to the nurses, they took it out, and when we looked at it, we still had, we had captured all the data but there was a disagreement about the appropriateness of the catheters being in. So we decided that now we tested our audit tool and that was effective to find the inappropriate catheters, we then needed to focus our attention on a bit of education for the people who were doing the auditing. So you're not surprised, we tested it with six nurses, gave them a little bit of a different education piece before they went out. They went out there, we had a look at the data that they brought back, and we agreed with what they'd said. So we agreed that the data that we were, had coming back then showed us which ones were inappropriate. And we decided then that we would be able to share that tool um, across the organization. But we had to do some more tra training, so we took a larger group, we repeated it twice, and the data was accurate. So this was our updated tool that we were able to capture the data on. Um, and as I said, you probably can't see it because it's very small writing, um, but it talks about the appropriateness of catheterization. And this little video was just going to show you um, the work just to precede down and ex we use this for uh, training um, of our new nurses so they know what we're actually re relating to when we talk about appropriate catheterization. The catheter UTI trap. In 2011, Salford Royal started work on reducing the number of catheter UTIs across the organisation. One of the approaches was to reduce the number of inappropriate catheters. The first difficulty was changing the culture. There was a lack of recognition of the dangers posed by catheters which meant that they were being used when no longer required, and in some cases a lack of awareness of which patients were catheterised on wards. The Catheter UTI Collaborative aimed to understand the dangers of catheters and estimated that every year 15 patients died at Salford Royal as a result of a catheter UTI. The Collaborative developed a tool to identify if a catheter had appropriate clinical indication to be used. The TRAP acronym was born. The indications that form TRAP are tissue viability, 
retention of urine, acutely unwell, preference on palliative care, post-surgery. In terms of tissue viability, it may be appropriate to catheterise when a patient has a sacral pressure ulcer and is incontinent. If a patient is in retention of urine and requires a catheter, carry out a scan using the bladder scanner and ensure residual volume is recorded in the flow sheet. Always consider possible alternatives. The catheter should be the last resort. If a patient requires level 2 or 3 care, or if a catheter has been requested by a senior decision maker, these would be deemed as appropriate reasons for catheterisation. However, again please consider alternatives. If a patient is under palliative care and requests a catheter for comfort, then this may be appropriate. Please ensure discussions with the patient and or family take place and are recorded in the patient notes. A catheter may be used post-surgery within the first 24 hours, unless there is a record by a senior decision maker with a clear indication for remaining and a planned removal date. In cases of prolonged immobilisation due to spinal fractures or trauma, a catheter would be deemed appropriate, provided there are no suitable alternatives. If the patient has a urological condition that indicates the use of a catheter, there must be evidence of a urological referral and a plan for ongoing care. The catheter care structured note is currently on EPR. It should be completed three times a day. This must be continued for 72 hours post removal to ensure accurate recording of catheter UTIs. You can find the catheter UTI change package on the catheter UTI page in the quality improvement section of the intranet. Okay, so uh, the EPR is our electronic patient records and the flow sheet is in the phase one, what we actually designed to make sure that we could capture every single catheter that was inserted in, uh, within the organisation. So are we using it? We, we did an initial review and the non-trap um, insertions had reduced from 25% down to uh, 12%. But there's clearly still room for improvement. We had an accurate means of identifying inappropriate catheters and we were planned to move that across the organisation. However, somewhere else in the organisation, another PDSA cycle had started and one of the ward managers had really got fed up actually with the senior nurses coming along and keep auditing their practice around catheters and they decided that they would use the audit sheet as an intervention tool to prompt the removal of catheters and they would use that on their safety huddles every morning having a look at check criteria and removing catheters where necessary. And the impact of that was that we saw a 42% reduction in catheter days just in that one setting. So clearly we want to implement that wider spread across the organisation. And the community teams, we've talked about them, the district nurses teams are now using the tool on a monthly basis. And they developed this award so that they could get some real good competition for talk of the week, so um, that really encouraged them to be engaged in the process. And these were the things that came out of the collaborative that they wanted to do. So what did the data tell us? Well, even if patients' activity fluctuates, the rate still has been reduced over time. And we've seen a 71% reduction in our CORTI rate. The relative reduction in CORTIs across the hospital is 62%, and that's a mean reduction of 34 down to 13 per month. Even when we've seen more catheter days in situ, so we count how many catheter days there are, even with fluctuating bed days and even with increased admissions, we still see a reduction. And what was really interesting to us, we wanted to see if we could triangulate that with any other data that we had. And the other data, as I inferred before, was that we had our safety thermometer data, and we could see the reduction in our safety thermometer da data as well. And, of course, when we were talking, we were talking about the impact that you can do work in the community, but clearly it had, um, in the acute setting, but clearly it had an impact in the community. 
and we could see that we had a relative reduction in community. This is the community caseload, so that we count how many patients with catheters in, had gone from a mean of 302 down to 231 on their caseload, which is a 23.5% reduction in the community catheters. So what we've done since then is we've put the change package together because we've come to the end of phase three. And I've just proceed here. So this is, this is a, a cheat sheet, if you like. This is, what, this is a, um, a reference to all the elements inside the um, courty change package. And you can see that you know, part of that is what I've referred to, is the measurement of catheters and infection, doing some work around patient experience, making sure that we're avoiding unnecessary catheter insertion by applying the trap, by making sure that we're removing catheters as soon as possible by um, using it as, a, as an intervention tool, as well as making sure that we've good, got good hand washing. And I haven't referred too much about the catheter care, but clearly there was work around that element as well. So just to summarize, Corti can be effectively reduced by healthcare professionals by implementing a range of very simple measures, if you like, across the hospital and community. It requires leadership and commitment and enthusiasm and resilience. Um, the ward and community staff can make a huge difference, and I think that's the, the, the big difference about these sorts of projects, using quality improvement, is that it comes from the teams. So they're engaged and they're, they're quizzical about what they need to do, and they also get that benefit. When we get to the top of that hill, that they uh, get the benefit of being there and knowing that it's shared. Use of structured training programs, shared learning, patient engagement, um, all is going to help reduce our courty rates, and I've certainly seen great examples of that this afternoon. So we know that we've got six people, six extra people who are spending time with their families this year because of the work that's been done, but we've still got work to do. Mm -hmm.